been traveling for many, many years spreading the gospel because there has been such an enormous interest in addressing what can we do to the climate challenge, what can we do for making more livable cities, more democratic and safe cities. All these issues have become more and more urgent and all over I find that people refer to Copenhagen as something which was quite amazing. My name is Jan Gale. I graduated as an architect from the Royal Academy in Copenhagen in 1960. I was trained in the 50s and we learned never to do cities no more. That was redundant, that was old-fashioned. Now we should make individual buildings and the whole area should be crisscrossed by fat, beautiful freeways. And I rushed out in 1960 to do all these wonderful things which will give modern man a better life. Then I married a psychologist and then at once we had in the house all these interesting questions between the uh, psychologists and us young architects and they kept saying why are you architects not interested in people? Have you considered why it is that your professors go out at four o'clock in the morning to photograph the buildings they are to show in the lectures to make absolutely sure that no people in the foreground will distract the students. 1960s was an interesting time because so much was being built and it was being built to the modernist tune and that was a time when the cars really started to flood our societies. So this was progress. More cars and high residential buildings separated. No city, no public space, no nothing. Absolutely nothing was known and written down about how the physical world influenced the life of people. Very early on I got a scholarship to go to Italy to live for half a year, where we went to study the life of the Italian piazza. After a while it was quite clear to see the patterns and to see why was this place very popular and why was this place not used at all and where were people standing, where were they talking. When we came back to Denmark, we wrote a number of articles. It was quite celebrated because it was about the first time ever that systematically studies of people in relation to architecture had been published. My story is really one, almost like the ugly duckling that for many years we were not very much happened and actually my architecture colleagues thought I was wasting my time. But then it was realized that there was something which was needed and then it became more and more popular. The latest book, Cities for People, six years old now and is out in 32 languages. And that has been almost like an explosion of interest. And these books are now textbooks which they were certainly not in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And I've been very persistent and stubborn in following this track. But the most urgent problem and the most important place where this kind of people-oriented tools can be used will certainly be in the fast-growing cities in the third world. Being good to people being good to pedestrians and public life, and also I will include bicycling. These are all very cheap things to do. Then the poor people can be mobile in quite another way, and then they can start to roam all over the cities to seek work, to go to work in the far end of the city, instead of being completely confined while the rich people are going around on the asphalt roads. There's a famous example uh, made by the mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, where uh, in his first term as mayor uh, around the year 2000, he said 80% of my people have no access to cars, 20% have cars. So far we used all the money for car infrastructure. In the time when I'm mayor I'll use all the money for the 80% who have no cars to make them more mobile and that is a sure way of having a better economy 
in this city and lifting some of the poor people out of the poverty and the illegal settlements and giving them a chance to have a working life and have a decent family life. It always takes time to implement a new way of thinking and that was indeed a new way of thinking to use city planning to change the economy of the poor people in the developing countries. It would be so wonderful if some of the cities would sort of be more stable in their policies. A city which has such st stability is indeed Copenhagen. Copenhagen really started very, very early to humanize their city. The main street of Copenhagen was pedestrianized in 1962. And now they have this universal policy for the whole city. We will be the best city for people in the world. It's good for climate. It's very good for your own health. Furthermore, and maybe most important, it's good for democracy, it's good for social inclusion, it's good for safety in the city, that people come out of their privatized spheres and join your fellow citizens in the public space, in nice public space. The biggest challenge I see is, of course, that by 250, 75% of the world's population are presumed to live in cities. That means that we shall build as much urban fabric in the next 30 years as we have done until now. It is so incredibly important that these very cheap humanistic planning ideas be implemented together with solving the other problems in these new urban settlements. What we can see now is that it is silly market trends to sell as many cars as possible in China or in India and that gives cities which every day is worse than the day before. In Copenhagen we've had now a run of 50 years where every day has been a little better than yesterday. That is a fantastic difference and we must make city planning especially in these fast-growing cities in the same way so that everybody can be assured that every day the city will be a little bit better than yesterday and the quality of life will be a little bit better for the citizens.